creation event at different distances with respect to Earth. So we can look at gas clouds in distant galaxies and measure the temperature of the radiation from the creation event. And as you can see in this curve here, it dramatically shows you how the temperature of the universe has gotten colder and colder as it's gotten older and older. Uh, today over at the right is 2.725 degrees above absolute zero, but we can look sufficiently far away, uh, 10, 11, 12 billion light years away, and measure the temperature uh, being around uh, 10 to 12 degrees above absolute zero. Temperature measurements are a near perfect fit to what the Big Bang creation event would predict for the declining temperature of the universe. This isn't the strongest scientific evidence for a Big Bang cosmology, but is one I think lay people can most easily understand. We can directly observe the universe getting colder and uh, colder. The other thing we can do is look at galaxies far away. This is a cluster of galaxies two billion light years away which means we're seeing it as it was two billion years ago because it took like two billion years to travel to us. And what I want you to notice is how different these galaxies look compared to galaxies that are 12 billion light years away. And right away I think you can notice, number one, the galaxies are of a different color, uh, the galaxies are of a different size, the galaxies here are highly regular, symmetrical, and uh, the galaxies here are not. And this isn't a scale. Another thing we notice is that the galaxies are much farther apart 2 billion light years away than they are 12 billion light years away. Here we have things to scale. So here you can see uh, those big galaxies are the ones that are 2 billion light years away are clearly farther apart from one another than galaxies that are 12 billion light years away. And let me give you some specific examples here. Uh, the first two are uh, galaxies in this cluster. You can see that they're highly symmetrical. Uh, the middle one, you can see faint spiral arms. You can see that the spiral arms are well developed, they're symmetrical. Uh, the galaxies are large and you notice that the color of the stars is yellow. Yellow is a color you get when a star has been burning for a long, long time. And what we see here is the color of great age. Uh, these stars have been burning for many billions of years. And the slide over at the right shows you that the galaxies are far apart. And, and they're quite bigger than galaxies that are 12 billion light years away. When we look at galaxies 12 billion light years away, the color is very different. The spiral arms are not yet developed. There hasn't been enough time for those spiral arms to develop. And over at the right, you can see that the galaxies are jammed much more tightly together, so much more tightly together, the galaxies are actually ripping pieces off one another. You can see the tadpoles uh, that are being ripped out there. The whole point is that we can actually watch the universe spreading apart as we look back in time. As we look back 12 billion light years away, the galaxies are jammed tightly together. As we look up close, the galaxies are much farther apart. And as we look at the rate at which they're spreading, it tells us the universe must have started off infinitesimally small. And we can actually watch the galaxies get older and older as we look farther and farther away. Therefore, we have a simple formula for calculating the age of the universe. The age of the universe would be its present size divided by the expansion rate. As we look at the universe, we have a continuous record of the past 13.4 billion years of the universe. And every single expansion measure, and we have many different ones, all establish that the universe is about 14 billion years old. It's middle age. Now another way I could demonstrate this is to look at radiometric elements. If the universe is very young, then we would expect that Neptunian, Plutonium, and Technetium would be present on both the Earth and the Sun. These are radiometric elements that have half-lives in the millions of years. And so if the universe were younger than, say, uh, one or two hundred million years, there should be lots of this stuff lying around on both the Sun uh, and uh, the Earth. And I would say, where does this stuff come from? Well, we can see it being produced in the stars. In fact, it's being continuously produced in certain kinds of stars. Now, if the universe is as old as what the atheists claim it is, then we would expect that all the uranium and thorium would be missing uh, on the Earth and the Sun. Uranium and thorium have half-lives of 4.5 and 14.1 billion years, respectfully, and they would have been completely decayed away if indeed the old universe model, the atheist model, the universe is right. Well, let's supposing it's middle age. A middle age universe, you would predict that the Neptunian, the Plutonium, and the Technetium 
would be missing on the Earth and Sun, but that uranium and thorium would be present. And that's exactly what we see in both the Earth and the Sun, that the ones with short half-lives are missing, the ones with half-lives in the billions of years are still here. Now, in addition to this, we have a set of tests to determine whether or not the Middle Age model is right, uh, the old model is right, or the young Earth model is right. It's what's called the light travel time test. I have a book here written by uh, Russ Humphreys called Starlight and Time. It's been through at least four different editions, and each one presents a slightly different model, but all of these models uh, speculate that clocks in the distant universe run at a very different rate than clocks here on Earth. What Russ Humphreys tries to do is to say, when we look at the distant universe, it testifies of a universe 14 billion years old, but if clocks in the distant universe run a million times faster than clocks here on Earth, uh, then that would explain why we see it the way we do. Now, the Middle Age universe model actually predicts that distant clocks will also run at a different rate because we have the universe expanding from the creation event. And as it expands, that tells us when the universe gets big, distant objects would move away from us at a good fraction of the velocity of light. And that would actually slow down the clock. So here are two opposite predictions. Uh, the young Earth model in this case predicts the clocks will run a million times faster. The old Earth model predicts that they would run 25% slower. Well, what do I mean by clocks? Here's an example of an astronomical clock. Uh, there are many clocks that astronomers can look at, but the one that's most effective are what we call supernova clocks. Uh, a supernova is a giant star that when it ends its burning cycle, when it runs out of fuel, it goes through a supernova eruption where for a few months that single star will shine as brightly as a hundred billion other stars in that galaxy. And it takes a couple of months for that star to reach maximum brightness and about five months for it to decay back down to a very dim light. So it's about seven months is the typical light cycle for a supernova eruption in our own galaxy. So that's a clock that would be up close. Now in terms of the distant supernova clock, uh, the model that we're defending at reasons to believe would predict that it would be about nine months. And the young Earth model uh, according to Russ Humphreys, would predict that it would be 18 seconds. Well, we can routinely make these measurements on many different supernova that are distant in the universe, and the answer is always consistent with the Middle Age universe. Not the very old universe and not the young universe. It's nine months, and we got